All right, so the last <coughs> segment of our lecture on meiosis is going to be about genetic variation. In sexually reproducing organisms, three processes lead to most genetic variation. Independent orientation of chromosomes in meiosis, crossing over of chromosomes in meiosis, and random fertilization. Each pair of homologous chromosomes consists of one chromosome inherited from the father and one from the mother. Here we have color-coded them blue and red. Each pair of chromosomes lines up independently of the other pairs in metaphase one of meiosis. Here you see one of the possible arrangements and outcomes. There are two different ways that each chromosome pair can line up. That means that in the organism shown here, with the diploid number of 4, independent orientation of chromosomes at metaphase 1 can produce gametes with four different combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes. In a human being, with 46 chromosomes, more than 8 million combinations are possible. Now let's look at how crossing over creates even more genetic variability. During prophase 1 of meiosis, Homologous chromosomes pair up very closely, and corresponding parts of two non-sister chromatids may trade places. This process of crossing over creates variation by producing chromosomes that combine the genes inherited from two parents. Here the process produced a total of four genetically different gametes. There are many ways crossing over can occur. In humans, crossover events happen an average of two or three times per chromosome pair greatly increasing the variation among eggs and sperm. Note that crossing over produces some parental gametes with chromosomes like those of the parents and some recombinant gametes with a mixture of genes from both sets of chromosomes. Independent orientation and crossing over occur simultaneously during meiosis, multiplying the number of genetic variations among gametes. Because each pair of chromosomes lines up independently and crossovers can occur almost anywhere along each pair of chromosomes, it is possible for a human being to produce an almost infinite variety of gametes. A sperm fertilizes an egg, producing a zygote. The random nature of fertilization adds to the variation arising from meiosis. Each parent is capable of producing a huge variety of genetically different gametes. The number of possible combinations among their offspring is staggering. Theoretically, one human couple is capable of conceiving a number of genetically different offspring that is far greater than the number of humans who have ever lived. All right, so In this case, looking at what gives rise to genetic variation, all right, we have mutations. Now, a true mutation has to occur within the DNA that's going to be in your gametic cells. All right, mutations that occur in somatic cells, like a skin cell, is going to affect the DNA of your your offspring. All right, it has to be a heritable mutation. Now, if you do have a mutation in the somatic cells that give rise to sperm and eggs, that's a different story. All right, you have independent assortment of chromosomes. All right, so this means that during this process of meiosis, how your chromosomes line up along the metaphase plate is random. All right, so whether it's on the, the left side of the cell or on the right side of the cell is a random process. You have the process of recombination or crossing over where you have the exchange of genes between non-sister chromatids between homologous chromosomes. And then you have random fertilization. Alright, so looking at 
independent assortment of chromosomes. So we have two possibilities. We have the parental chromosomes on the left, or paternal on the left, we have the maternal on the right. All right, so blue being paternal, red being maternal. All right, so after minus is one, we have our two haploid cells. All right, all the paternal chromosomes are on the left, all the maternal chromosomes are on the right. Now, each daughter cell then goes through meiosis two, where your sister chromosomes separate. All right, well, you have paternal chromosomes, blue and blue, maternal, red and red. Okay. Now, looking at the second possibility, you have a paternal on the left, maternal on the left, maternal on the right, paternal on the right. You separate during meiosis one. Now you have a daughter cell with a paternal and maternal chromosome. All right, those separate during meiosis two. So now each daughter cell has a different combination of chromosomes than that of your parent. All right, so these combinations are completely different from these. And they all arise due to how your chromosomes, how your homologous chromosomes, and how your sister chromatids of your chromosomes orient themselves towards the right and left poles of the cell. During prophase one of meiosis, homologous chromosomes pair up very closely, and corresponding parts of two non-sister chromatids may trade places. This process of crossing over creates variation by producing chromosomes that combine the genes inherited from two parents. Here the process produced a total of four genetically different gametes. There are many ways crossing over can occur. In humans, Crossover events happen an average of two or three times per chromosome pair, greatly increasing the variation among eggs and sperm. Note that crossing over produces some parental gametes with chromosomes like those of the parents, and some recombinant gametes with a mixture of genes from both sets of chromosomes. All right, so we're gonna look at this process of recombination. All right, so we're looking at two mice. All right, so we have these mice that either have a brown coat and black eyes or white coat and pink eyes. All right, for this case, all right, you have this mouse. Well, it has, for all intents and purposes, let's say that it is homozygous dominant for both both genes. All right, so it has two copies of a dominant brown coat gene, and it has two copies of the black eyes genes. All right, so this is its respective genotype, black fur, or brown fur, black eyes. All right. Down here, a little white mouse. A little white mouse has is homozygous as well, except it's homozygous recessive. All right. So we get a white coat, and then it has pink eyes. All right. So that's its respective genotype. All right. It's homozygous recessive for both particular traits. Well, that's what we're seeing here. All right, so this chromosome, you have a parental cell, homologous chromosome. Here we have a, a mouse that has the following combination of, of genes.
All right, so in this case, it's all right, header, I guess, in this example. All right, so on your maternal chromosome, all right, for this example, you have your dominant alleles and on your paternal chromosome you have your recessive alleles. Now these are homologous chromosomes all right, because they encode the same characteristics. All right, so we have our fur and we have our eye color. All right, so those are the same characteristics. We have two different traits. We have an allele for brown fur, which we distinguish as big C, that's one allele. And then we have an allele for white fur, little c. We have an allele for black eyes, big E. And we have an allele for pink eyes, little e. <clears throat> so even though this individual has a copy of each respective allele for a respective gene, it still exhibits the dominant trait because it has a copy of the dominant allele. All right, so here we have our homologous chromosomes. All right, they've undergone um, all the way through interphase, so they've replicated. Okay, so here you're looking at your chromatids. So That's a big C, that's a big E. That's a little C, that's a little E. Okay, so you have your maternal chromosome here. You have your paternal chromosome there. So these homologous pairs line up, okay. Now, during recombination, you have a double strand break in your non sister chromatids. Okay. Now you have invasion of these respective arms of your chromosomes cross one another. All right, so they crisscross and they interlock and they form this X-shaped region referred to as your chiasma or chiasmata. All right, so now <clears throat> the DNA, the chromosomes are interlocked with one another. Now what's gonna happen next is that this chiasmata is going to move in this direction. And as it does so, your the arms of the chromosomes will migrate and separate from one another so that you end up with this chromosome and this one. They're still homologous, but you notice now that your maternal chromosome has on one arm, one chromatid, has a section of paternal genes. All right, so the gene for pink eyes. And you'll see here that your paternal chromosome has a section of the gene for black eyes. Okay. So now <clears> through <throat> this process of meiosis, your individual homologous chromosomes separate, your individual sister chromatids separate, you end up with four possible results in this example. 
you end up with a chromosome with both copies of the dominant alleles, which is exactly like the parent. You end up with two copies of the recessive alleles, which is exactly like the parent. Or you end up with a, a mix and match. All right, so you end up with a copy that was on the parent, one from the other. Copy from the other parent, one from the other. All right, so these are recombinant because you have recombining of genes that weren't there before. All right, so in this case, you have alleles for brown fur and black eyes. Here you have brown fur and pink eyes. Here you have white fur and black eyes. Here you have white fur and pink eyes. All right, so this gives you another view of what's going on during recombination. Your homologous chromosomes pair up through synapses. You have crossing over between homologous chromosomes. Your homologous chromosomes separate. You notice here now you have sections of these chromosomes which have different regions that are of different colors than the parent chromosomes. So your paternal chromosome has segments of red, your maternal chromosome has segments of blue, indicating recombination, exchange genes. Your sister chromatids separate later on during anaphase two, and as a result you end up with chromosomes that are just like the parent. You notice they're a little different. These two here are your recombinants. Now, sometimes <clears throat> during this process of meiosis, things don't go always as they should. All right, you can have something that's called non disjunction that takes place, where your chromosomes fail to properly separate from one another. So either your homologous chromosomes fail to separate or your individual sister chromatids fail to separate. All right, so this can happen during meiosis one and meiosis two. All right, so anaphase one and anaphase two of meiosis. All right, your chromosomes are separating. Well, they fail to pro properly separate, you end up with daughter cells with inappropriate number of chromosomes. All right, so looking at this process of non-disjunction, we have two different scenarios. Let's say non-disjunction happens in meiosis one. All right, well, here, your homologous chromosomes fail to separate. All right, so your homologous chromosomes are failing to separate here. All right, so this is non-disjunction. These two homologous chromosomes do separate, separate as they should. So when a cell divides, you end up with eventually a cell with three chromosomes here and one chromosome there. At the end of meiosis two, you end up with daughter cells that have three chromosomes, three chromosomes, one chromosome, one chromosome. All right, so you originally start off with four. All right, so ideally, at the end of meiosis, each daughter cell should have two total chromosomes. All right, in this example. All right, but we end up with a situation where we have one too many. We have three. And we end up with a situation where we only have one. All right, so this is anapoidy. All right, so let's say that non-destruction occurred during meiosis two. All right, so everything goes as it should. 
during meiosis one, your homologous chromosomes separate properly. Well, over here, you have, in this daughter cell on the left, you have your sister chromatids that fail to separate as they should. So you end up with a daughter cell with three chromosomes. You end up with a daughter cell with one chromosome. You end up with two daughter cells with the appropriate number of chromosomes, two. So when you're, let's say for example, you have a normal sperm cell with two chromosomes, that's a proper complement, and you have an egg cell with an abnormal number of chromosomes, three, all right, in this situation. They combine, you get five total chromosomes. Well, you should only have two sets, two pairs, all right? But in this instance, you have an extra third copy of one of your chromosomes. All right, so how do we detect chromosome abnormalities? Well, one thing is you can perform a karyotype. All right, so here you're actually looking at the individual chromosomes from a cell. And you arrest the dividing cells in metaphase. All right, because this is when your chromosomes, all right, they're highly condensed and they're all lined up along the metaphase plate. All right, so they're real easy to see and they're real easy to compare with one another. All right, now what you do is you would actually chemically treat the cells to a halt all the cells in metaphase. Okay, so karyotypes allow you to look at how many homologous pairs of chromosomes you have, it allows you to look at the total chromosome number, individual chromosome number. Look at the chromosome structure. All right, so to generate a karyotype, you take a blood culture. All right, you would spin that culture down using a centrifuge. All the heavy elements spin down at the bottom. You're left with the white blood cells, which are a little bit lighter than your, your red blood cells, and then your, your plasma is on the top. All right, so you would treat your sample with a hypotonic solution. Well, your red blood cells are extremely susceptible to hypotonic solutions. They lice. Your white blood cells are a little bit more hardy. Well, here's the thing. Your red blood cells, with their mature red blood cells, they don't have a nucleus. Well, if it doesn't have a nucleus, well, that's going to be a problem. So here, we're going to use our white blood cells that do have a nucleus. All right, so we fix our white blood cells and we stain them. And then you examine the stained samples and look at the individual chromosomes. Now this would be basically a, a cut and paste method of having to go, okay, that's chromosome one, that's chromosome two, three, four, so on, and pair them together. So you end up with a karyotype, all right, a map of the total number of chromosomes in an individual cell. Now, looking at a practical application of a karyotype and non-disjunction. All right, so looking at Down syndrome. All right, so individuals with Down syndrome have an extra copy of the 21st chromosome, hence the name trisomy 21. All right, so you should have two copies. All right, we're diploid. We have two copies of each chromosome, but in this case, these individuals have three copies of chromosome 21. All right, so these individuals have very characteristic facial features. All right, they're typically shorter in stature, um, susceptible to heart conditions, asthma, Alzheimer's, uh, learning disabilities, and in this case, when you're looking at Down syndrome, all right, you see a, an interesting trend in that as the age of the expect, expectant mother increases, 
all right, the increase in risk for having a child with Down syndrome also increases. All right, so here, looking at a, a normal complement of chromosomes, all right, so this is our, our normal complement. Now, granted, all right, for comparison's sake, all right, this is a male, all right, but for all comparisons, we're comparing this carrier type to this one. All right, she has two copies of the the X chromosome, so she's female. Okay, but here, what you're really looking at is this chromosome here, chromosome 21. All right, so here you have two copies in a normal complement. Here you have three copies, trisomy 21. So. Individuals, females, as they age, you have an increased likelihood of having offspring with Down syndrome. All right, so after age 35, your risk of having infants with Down syndrome increases exponentially. All right, so why is that the case? Well, think about it. Think about the eggs. All right. A girl is born with all the eggs she's ever going to produce. And once a girl hits puberty and starts having her period, right, she starts every month releasing those eggs. Well, those eggs sit there from, you know, preteen ages of, you know, up to 11 when you start menstruating, 11, 12 until menopause when you no longer menstruate. All right, so that's a really long time for those eggs to sit there. And so there's this idea that there are, are proteins involved either in how the spindle fibers attach to your chromosomes or proteins that are involved in making sure that your spindle fibers are attached to your chromosomes to regulatory proteins, or proteins that are involved in basically separation of your synaptonyl complex, all right, is that cleaved prior to your homologous chromosome separating? About your separase enzymes that cleave your cohesin proteins between your sister chromatids, are those functioning properly? All right, so there's all these different areas that could lead to a sperm cell or an egg cell having an extra copy of the 21st chromosome through non-disjunction. Right, so failure of the chromosomes to separate. And again, that can happen during anaphase one or two of meiosis. All right, so looking at <clears throat> some other types of alterations to chromosome structure. All right, so you can have a deletion of a chromosome segment. All right, you can have a duplication where a section of a gene or non coding region is duplicated. You can have an inversion where that section of a gene actually reorients itself in the opposite direction. Or you have a translocation where that section of a gene or the chromosome breaks off and reattaches elsewhere, either onto the same chromosome or another chromosome. All right, so here, looking at these different situations, all right, for chromosome abnormalities. So we have a chromosome. If you delete a section of that chromosome, you remove those genes and that chromosome length shortens. All right, a duplication, if you have a duplication of a gene, if this gene duplicates, or that region of the chromosome duplicates, all right, and it gets reinserted right after it, all right, 
the chromosome length increases, and you get two copies of the same gene. <clears throat> you can have an inversion, where let's say this is L, and that's R. Well, if it inverts, you can get R and get L. <clears throat> and then you can have a translocation. All right, so in this case, this section of this chromosome is breaking off and attaching here. This section of this chromosome is breaking off and attaching there. All right, so this is a reciprocal translocation. All right, so here you see the end result. You have red and blue. All right, so this is the little red segment here. And this little blue segment is the one here. All right, and then this segment is here. This red segment is here. All right, so these sections of the chromosome attach to other chromosomes. There's a reciprocal translocation. Now you can have a translocation event that's not reciprocal, all right, where you have a chromosome portion here, all right, so let's say you have like chromosome 2, let's say you have like chromosome 5, all right, get a, got B, C, Z, D. Let's say this part gets cut off. Well, chromosome two shortens. All right, you're left with D. And let's say that portion attaches to chromosome five here. All right, so chromosome five increases in length, chromosome D shortens, all right, because this section of this chromosome two got moved here. <clears throat> so let's look at a, an application of <clears throat> reciprocal translocation. So chronic myelogenous leukemia, all right, so here you have a very specific um, reciprocal translocation between very specific chromosomes. All right, so a portion of chromosome 22 switches with chromosome 9. So <clears throat> this causes cancer by activating a gene that leads to uncontrolled cell cycle progression. Okay, so here. <clears throat> This little end segment of chromosome 9 attaches there. This section of chromosome 22 attaches there. So as a result, this particular gene on chromosome 9 that was on chromosome 9 that was initially turned off is now turned back on because <clears throat> Typically, and from a gene, you'll have regulatory elements to control whether or not that gene is turned on or off. Well, if you, tr if you move that to another chromosome, those regulatory elements can no longer control or regulate that particular gene. All right, so now that gene is turned on, or can be turned on and activated. <clears throat> 